Hello everyone. It's my pleasure to be carrying on in our new series, Life. Now, last week, Terry kicked us off by thinking about what, what kind of life it is that God wants us to live. What kind of life it is that he offers to us, an abundant life, a full life. Today, I want to continue exploring life. And I want to think about what it means to live life with purpose. Last week, um, as part of what Terry was sharing, he was helping us to remember that the life that we live, God wants a certain kind of life for us, but there is also an enemy. There is also Satan who wants to steal and to rob and to destroy that life in us. And today, as we continue to explore what a life with purpose looks like, we're going to be thinking about some of the things that actually the enemy, the devil, wants to do to stop us from embracing that purpose and that life. So we're going to explore what a life with purpose looks like. There are parts of this that may be uncomfortable, that may be difficult, but I, but I promise, I believe it is all really, really important. So uh, to carry on with, with exploring that, we're going to be looking at a story in the Bible and at something that Jesus said now, this took place on the day that we remember as Palm Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday in the Christian calendar, the week before Easter Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, we remember Jesus arriving in Jerusalem in what would be the last week of his earthly life before his death and his resurrection. And on that Palm Sunday, there was a crowd. There was a crowd that welcomed him into Jerusalem as king. And that crowd would turn on him later in the week. But for now... These are people who want him, who want to receive him, who, who believe that what he stands for is something that they want to be a part of. Uh, at, at the final part of John's version of that story, John, one of the writers in the Bible, an eyewitness who shared the story of Jesus' life, at the end of his description of that, of that crowd and of, of, of Jesus' arrival, we hear these words about Jesus' enemies, the Pharisees. So the Pharisees said to one another, See? This is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. They're saying all of these plans that they've made to try and stop him, to try and defeat him, to try and get people to stop being interested in him, it's not worked. Look, the whole world is going after him. And they're not just talking about the size of the crowd. They're talking about who's in it. Because it's no longer just Jewish people who are interested in Jesus. It's people from lots of different ethnicities and lots of different places in the world who'd all come to Jerusalem for this important week and who were now all hearing about, about Jesus. It had, it had grown, and that was starting to be a real concern for Jesus' enemies. And so it's into that context that we hear about some non-Jewish people who came to visit Jesus. And this is where we pick up the story. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The Son of Man was Jesus' uh, most uh, favourite way of talking about himself. He's referring to himself. He's saying the time has come for me to be glorified. He's seen this crowd. He's seen that it's made up of lots of different kinds of people. And some of them, some of the non-Jewish people, some of these Greeks, some of the Gentiles came to him and wanted to speak with him. They were interested in finding out more. And Jesus returns by saying, the hour has come. Now, if you read through the whole of John's eyewitness story of Jesus, you see that again and again and again, Jesus is asked something and he says, my hour has not yet come. He's asked to do something that would display his power and he says, my time has not yet come. An opportunity presents itself and he says, my hour, my time has not yet come. But now, this is the first time that Jesus says now, my hour has come. This climactic moment, this, this idea of the purpose of his life, what it was that he came to do, it is now beginning to unfold. This is a moment that Jesus himself uh, signifies as being, being momentous, being climactic. And we get to ask the question, well, in Jesus's eyes, what does a climactic moment look like? In Jesus's eyes, what was the purpose of his life? Why did he come? And how can we see it embodied in what he would go on to say here? And then he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This idea that this moment, that this, what, what was about to happen would be his crowning glory. Our verse for the year as a church, Gold Hill, 
is Psalm 115 verse 1 that says, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. It's a declaration on our part that nothing, that none of our lives, that none of church, that none of what we're doing is about us. It's all about God. It's all about what he wants. And in these moments, Jesus is saying that he is the one who will be glorified, that he is the one who will take center stage in some ways, that he is the one who will achieve God's purposes. So what does that even mean and what does that look like? Well, as we look at Jesus's words, I want to think about our lives as well and what it means, as I said, to live a life with purpose. And we're going to, as we continue to see what Jesus said in response to these people, we're going to see a principle of a life with purpose. We're going to see a hard choice that needs to be made if we're going to live a life with purpose. And we get to see a promise of what a life with purpose really can mean. So a principle of a life with purpose. Let's carry on reading and see what it is that Jesus continued to say. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honour the one who serves me. So Jesus has just announced that, that he's speaking about this, that, that his time has come, that, that the time has come for his purposes to be fulfilled. And then he carries on speaking and he uses this image of a, of a seed, of a plant that has borne seeds. And it says, as long as, the, as long as the seed stays kind of within that plant, and doesn't fall to the ground and die, it can never produce more life. It's not a complicated gardening analogy. We know that if we have a packet of seeds, it's never going to do anything. It's, it's dead matter. But when it's planted in the ground, it can start to produce life. Jesus is using that image to say that in order to bring life, something is going to need to die. It's not a complicated agricultural image that Jesus is using. But what comes next, as he unpacks it and explains it, is very hard to hear. He says anyone who loves their life will lose it. But anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Is Jesus saying I meant to hate my existence, that I meant to hate my life, that you're meant to hate the fact that you're alive? I don't think he is. But he's talking about, if we use that seed image, image again, he's talking about the difference between clinging on to the life that we have Imagine the seed who's, who, who's sort of maybe within the husk of that plant, that, that, that seed clinging on to its status, clinging on to its position, saying, I'm not going to leave. This is what life must be. I'm going to cling on to it. I'm not going to let go. Versus laying our lives down, being willing to let go of something. What is that something? We'll come to that. But being willing to lay something down instead of clinging on to it. Jesus uses the language of if we love our life, if we want to hold on to the life we've got, ultimately we will lose it. We all know that that is true. Nothing that we have, our life, our stuff, our relationships, none of them will last forever. But if we choose not to love this life and cling on to it and hold on to it, but are willing to lay it down, then we can have something that is eternal. But Jesus, in, 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 in saying this, Remember, he's presenting what life can be, but there is an enemy. There is another side to this. There's, there's something that wants to try and rob us of that significance and that purpose. In these verses, I think there's a couple of things that we can see, or a couple of responses that we could have, that will rob us of that purpose, of that significance that Jesus offers us. The first is a lack of confidence. See, Jesus says um, that you can't produce many seeds unless that seed has died. And you might be there going, thinking, well, but I'm not the kind of person that will produce many seeds. I may as well just cling on to the life I've got. I may as well just live life in the here and now as I know it. I, I, I shouldn't aspire for anything bigger. I shouldn't aspire for anything greater. I shouldn't be even thinking about what it means to live life with purpose. What purpose could I possibly achieve? Can I ever do anything? I'm, I'm just me. I think those thoughts quite often. But actually what God speaks over your life is totally different from that. I want to declare to you and over you 
that there is so much potential that God has placed in you. Elsewhere in the New Testament, uh, Paul, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, he said this. He said, for God, who said, let light shine into darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. There's lots of words in there. But the basic idea is that the same God who said, let there be light, and there was light where previously there was darkness, has spoken into you and into me if we have chosen to follow Jesus. And when God said, let there be light, what came next? The universe came next. Everything was spoken into being. When God speaks into us, he plants a seed of potential that is so great and so big and so overwhelming. Do not believe that you can never achieve anything. Do not believe that you have no potential, that you have no purpose, that you have nothing to give. You do because God has given it to you. There is a universe of potential within you. You might be thinking that this seed and this new seeds image, well, it doesn't apply to me. There's nothing that I could do. There's no fruit that could come from me. Inside every single person who follows Jesus, there is the potential for hundreds, thousands, millions of lives to be impacted if we will take what he's given us, that potential in us, and we will use it for his purposes. The devil does not want you to believe that. The devil wants to rob that truth from you and take it away and make you unconfident, make you not pursue a life with purpose, make you just continue with the status quo, be happy with the here and now. Jesus wants something far greater and bigger for you. The second thing that I think can hold us back from embracing this purpose is not a lack of confidence, but is a fear of lacking control or, or comfort that we're going to have to when we lay something down, we're going to lose something. We're going to lose control. We're going to lose comfort. And we don't necessarily want to do that. To this, I don't have a lot to say other than we might just need to be willing to let that happen. What Jesus wants for us is always best, is always good. But it does come at the cost of giving up control and perhaps giving up comfort. You can't cling to a comfortable life if you want to embrace the life that Jesus wants for you, because it may not be comfortable. Jesus goes on in those words to talk about serving, to talk about serving him and that God will honour the one who serves. This is not about clinging on to comfort, clinging on to control. This is about us giving ourselves to God and saying, use me how you want. How will you serve God? How will you be used? I don't know. That's between you and God. Last week, Terry really helpfully drew a comparison between two people who in some ways seem worlds apart, Mother Teresa and Ken Costa. Here are some things that each of them said. Mother Teresa said, I am a little pencil in the hand of a writing God who is sending a love letter to the world. It's a declaration that she's saying, I am just a servant in God's hands. And here's what Ken Costa said. The key to making the best of your life The key to discovering your calling is to be with Jesus. It's a declaration that he is a servant in the hands of God. These two people, at the very core of their life and the way they lived it and the purpose that they had was to recognise that it wasn't about what they wanted. It was about what God wanted them. And they couldn't have lived much more different existences. They couldn't have, have pursued God's purposes in much more different ways. That didn't matter. God had a different plan for each of them. They had to lay down different things. They had to pick up different things. The question isn't what. The question is, are we willing? The question is, are we willing to give ourselves? Because the the principle of a life with purpose is that we give of ourselves, that we are willing to lay ourselves down so that something greater and bigger can come. That involves sacrifice. And Jesus knew it involved sacrifice when he said it. He knew it involved sacrifice for him. As we carry on, we'll see that Jesus had a hard choice to make. Let's carry on reading. Jesus said, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, 
glorify your name. I mean, talk about practicing what you preach. Jesus has just talked about the importance of laying yourself down, of being willing to let go, of being willing to give yourself in service of something else, and that being the key to purpose in life. And then he goes on and he does it. He knows that his hour has come. He knows that that for him means literally laying down his life. He knew that the cross was coming and he says, my soul is troubled. Now that could sound just like flowery, poetic language. Let's, let's remember that a few days later, Jesus would be in a garden knowing he was about to be arrested, betrayed, put on trial, falsely convicted and killed. And as he was praying to God, he was, he was so intense that he was, he was sweating and sweating so much and so intense was his physical anxiety that the, the capillaries in his, in his blood started to, started to pop and he started to sweat blood. This is not just, oh, my soul is troubled in a sort of Shakespearean melodramatic way. This is a man whose soul is troubled. This is a man who knows the cost of what is coming. And he has a choice to make. He has a choice and he says there are two things basically that he could pray. He could pray, Father, save me from this hour. Or he could pray, Father, glorify your name. And he chooses the second one. Will he pray, save me? Protect me from this? Stop this happening? Maintain my comfort? Maintain my control? Let me continue as I am? Or will he say, Lord, whatever you want. Father, whatever you want. Will you get the glory from this? Whatever I need to go through, whatever will happen to me, God, I trust that there is a plan. I know that what you're leading me to, you will lead me through. See, God often does his greatest work in those times of our life that are hardest. I don't want to talk about this too much because actually we've got a whole week in this life series about when life goes wrong, when life is tough. But Friends, remember that it was through Jesus' own suffering that the greatest victory in humanity was ever won. And sometimes it's in our own sufferings that the greatest victories in our lives will come. A few years ago, I went through the hardest time in my life after, after my, my wife had an affair and we were going through a divorce. And during that time of great suffering, I had a text from a friend who was close enough to be able to see what was going on in my life and see the impact it was having. And this is what it said. He said, you've been very open about the fact that you are suffering at the moment. He said, you've shown great, great dignity through this trial. But I believe also something more is happening. It's also a fact that our Lord Jesus Christ suffered. Although obviously your suffering is not good, I do believe I am seeing you become more Christ-like during this time of suffering. This is in its own way exciting for me and hopefully for you as well. Well, I confess that at the time I wasn't excited, but I was touched and I was encouraged by this message because it reminded me that as I was suffering, as I was struggling, I was associating myself with Jesus that I was perhaps closer to him than I would ever otherwise be because he had experienced suffering and pain and sacrifice. What's the biggest struggle in your life right now? The biggest fear, the biggest hurdle, the biggest trial, the thing that you know is coming in the future for you, that is where this choice lands. That is where this choice comes. Will you say, Lord, save me from this, protect me from this, take this away from me? Or will you say, Lord, even if I need to go through this, I will trust you. And would you work out your purposes through it? One of the, the keys to a purpose-filled life is being willing to take the highs and the lows and whatever it is, pursue God's purposes in them. Giving up your own right to control or comfort and instead letting God do what God wants to do. So we've thought about a principle, we've thought about a hard choice. Now comes a promise because this prayer, Father, glorify your name, was heard and was answered as we carry on. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it 
and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So there's this divine voice, this divine proclamation. And Jesus says it's not actually for his benefit. He's made up his mind already. He knows what it is that he's going to do. It's for the benefit of others. And he goes on to say that he knows that now is the time for two things, for the judgment to come to the world and for the prince of this world, which is the way that he's talking about the devil, about Satan, about the enemy, to be driven out, to be defeated. He talks about judgment and he talks about Satan being defeated. Now, that judgment thing, we can hear that word judgment as a very negative thing, but judgment is both a positive and a negative thing, depending on which side you're on. See, it, judgment is about judging things that are right and that are good and that are beautiful and lifting those up. And it's also about naming and calling out those things that are wrong. There is so much wrong in our world that we want to see, that all of us have that desire, that hunger to see ended, to see stopped, to see put to a halt. There's also good things and wonderful things that we want to, we want to see acknowledged and recognised and commended and celebrated. And Jesus is saying that in what would come about now, he was putting in place the opportunity for God's righteous judgment about everything, good and bad, to come into fruition. But it would also be, and this is the promise, it would also be the way that the enemy, that Satan, would be defeated. You see, Satan thought he was going to win through this. He thought, if I can just get this guy killed, if I can put an end to Jesus' life, then I will have won. But remember, the purpose that Jesus speaks about is one that comes about through sacrifice, through laying ourselves down, through being willing to suffer, through being willing to serve, even at our own expense. That is how Jesus would fulfil his purpose. What looked like a victory to Satan was a defeat of Satan. And what looked like a defeat of Jesus was actually Jesus' greatest victory. Because death wouldn't stay dead, it would rise back to life and that seed that had been planted in the ground would, would sprout to produce more and more and more and more life. That's what we remember this time of year, that's what we remember at Easter. But here there is a declaration from Jesus that his team will win. And friends, if you pursue a life of purpose, as Jesus describes it, a life of purpose as he commends, one that is about giving of ourselves, one that is about laying ourselves down in service of him and of others, instead of clinging to control, clinging to comfort, clinging to what we have now, if we give of ourselves, if we place ourselves in his team, playing by his rules, with his tactics, then we will be on the winning team and then everything that we do can have not just temporary purpose but eternal purpose. If you want your life to have a purpose that will outlive you, that will outlive this world, then you need to give your life and give yourself to something that itself outlives this world and outlives your life and that can only be found in Jesus. Jesus who practiced what he preached, who said that in order to take up your life you need to lay down your life, would then go on to lay down his life in order that he and others could take up their life too. So friends, my question to you is who are you serving? Who are you giving yourself to? Are you just trying to live for yourself? for your own comfort, for your own security, for your own goals and dreams? Or have you chosen today, maybe every day, 
Because it's a daily choice to say, God, I am yours. I am giving myself to you. Whatever you want, I'll go there. Let me pray for us. Lord God, I want to thank you. Thank you that you place potential in us, that we don't need to settle for little, for small, for safe. Lord, help us to seek and to embrace your life, your purpose, your will for our lives. And Lord, for those specific things that people need to lay down right now, we ask that you'd give us the courage and the strength to do so. Guard us in times of pain, in times of hardship, and help us to know that even in them, you can and you love to achieve your purposes. Lord, give us purpose. Give us life. Amen.